So in any case, okay, so we're talking about stop losses today, um, which is uh, a relatively sore topic for a lot of people. So I'm going to start off with questions, and I hope you guys will answer them, uh, which are basically these four questions, and anyone is welcome to answer. So for I mean, what, what is the purpose of trading? Why do we do it? To make money, okay? And that's pretty much it, right? Okay, so how do we do that? How do we make money for it? For more credit. <laughs> okay. Um, so, but I mean, what, 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 how do we do that? We use technical analysis, we use all sorts of fundamental analysis, we use uh, all these methods to try and help us to make money, right? Most simply put, the way that we make money trading is by remaining disciplined. The minute you lose discipline, you lose money. You can literally flip a coin 50 50 when you're to the You still lose money in a game where the odds are 50 50 that you're winning. So the only way to make money is to stay disciplined. So, how do we, uh, what prevents us from, from staying this disciplined? It's ourselves, it's our own belief system, what we think is right and wrong, it's what we've been taught through high school, it's our habits, it's our value systems. All these psychological things that we drag with us uh, influence the way that we make decisions, right? And that, there thus, has an impact on how we uh, perceive and manage risk. So how do we overcome those challenges? And that is simply by setting a, uh, a set of rules that we have to follow in order to manage ourselves, to manage our own emotions, to manage our own decision-making process. Right? So we have to look at how to set those rules. And the thing is, a lot of people, I mean, if I say, who knows what the 10% rule is, if I show of hands, or sorry, 2%, if I show of hands, okay, very unenthusiastic, but everybody, right? Um, so if we all know the rules, why do we lose money? <laughs> and that's not because the rules don't work, it's because we don't follow the rules. So we have to be very honest with ourselves and we're going to go through uh, basically uh, one way of, of, of managing risk and trying to maximize profit and a couple of ways to identify where to put stop losses and all that kind of stuff. But all of that is useless, in truth, if you guys are not willing to stick to the rules. Right? And the rules, it's the hard because we make the rules ourselves and because we make the rules, we feel that we can bend them. Um, so the, the main core here of this whole thing is that we have to remain disciplined. The stop losses are there literally to protect you. So a couple of facts about trading. Uh, we make money by being, we can make money by being right half the time. We can make money by being right less than half the time. Right? You can be right one out of every ten times and still make money if we have adequate risk management uh, systems. You look at me with disbelief. No, I, I, I'm not in theory it's possible. In theory it's possible, right? <laughs> it's a numbers game. You have to have a large number of trades in order to make money over time. If you do only five trades and you've got a 50 50 chance of being right, let's say you lose three and you win two. Okay, great. Good proper risk management you would have made some money, but it's not really generating large income. In order to generate money with this thing over time, you have to be able to do many trades. Right? You have to do a couple of hundred trades a year, basically. Um, and the, the thing is there that we blow ourselves up before we get to the point where we made a hundred trades. Many people open trading accounts and within the first few months, the money's gone or significantly damaged and it takes them some time, they save up and put more money in and they never learn lessons to get them beyond sort of just booming and busting, right? Um, so your trading, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a weird thing because there's a distribution between winners and losers. So if you have a trading strategy, and this is stuff we've spoken about in the past, all it's doing is it's creating a, a way of putting a statistical edge in your favor, right? The higher probability of one thing happening over another. And that is your edge, and if you then play that out over 100 trades, or 200 trades, or 500 trades, then over time you start to accumulate money, right? But the distribution between individual trades, winners and losers, is random. 
So you can have you know, 10 losers, 2 winners, 20 winners, 2 losers. The, the distribution and how those come to you is completely <laughs> random. Consistently sticking to the method that you're using is what then creates consistent results from this random distribution of events. Right? Um, so we have to create some sort of a model that we use. Uh, so some people will call it quantitative analysis, other people call it technical analysis, other people call it just training. <coughs> right? We have to have a set of things that we can take when we do what. And if we can stick to those rules, then we can build something or we can, you know, if we can stick to that model, then the random distribution of winners and losers will then over time play out to be a consistent profit. That's the goal, right? To create, from chaos, create consistency. Um, so, what happens is you have these random outcomes. So, when you say, for example, I'm going to lose one rand when I get it wrong, I'm going to lose two rand when I get it wrong. What then happens is, every now and then, you lose ten rand when you get it wrong. And you still only make two rand when you get it wrong. That one random outcome now destroys your entire model. Because your model should say to you that over time, if I lose only one rand and make two rand at a time, I'll make money. But then you have one random outcome that instead of losing one, as per your rules, you lose ten. Now your entire thing is thrown off because you've now got to do a lot of work to make up for that one mistake. So we have to understand that in order to, to cut that, in order for the model to be successful, we've got to cut out those individual random big losses. Simon talks about this often. We you can take small losses, small wins, big wins. Never take big losses, right? And that's those those big losses, those individual random, you know, outcomes that are beyond what our rules allow us to be. Those are the things that kill us. And those are often when people see these win-only scenarios. You know, uh, good examples is um, it's the election, this and that. You know, Rand's going to uh, it's going to weaken a lot. Guy goes all in for Rand weakness. A day later, he's got 75% of his money wiped from his account because he had a no-lose scenario. Like he couldn't, there was no way that he could, he could lose. It was a win-only scenario. And that almost always guarantees death, right? Because we think that there's no way that we can get it wrong. And we lose that discipline. And we come back to the number one sort of thing. Our main prerogative as traders or as people who interact with, with financial markets is to protect our capital. Because the longer we can protect our capital, the longer we can stay in the game. We all think trading is about making money, and yes it is, but to a large extent it's about surviving, about protecting your money so that when an opportunity comes, you can take it. Right? Every now and then there's an opportunity so great you can't miss, but if you don't have any money to trade it, then you're out of the game. It's okay, you can still call yourself a trader even though you haven't taken a real trade in, in a year. Because what you're doing is you're making sure that you have money in a trading account. You're ready to react when there's an opportunity. And that is really it. The guys that make the most money in this game aren't the guys who sit and trade 500 times a day. They take two or three trades a year, but when they get it right, they get it right in a big way. Right? <coughs> so we have to make sure we're all wanting to be active and trade all the time. It's a lot of fun, and I do it as well, and I advocate for that, right? But in order to be able to stick around long enough, we have to make sure that we protect our capital. And that is the core purpose of risk management, right? So, a couple of notes. You, if you're going to trade without knowing where, where you're going to stop out, okay, what are the, what are the um, circumstances or conditions where the market would have proved to me that I'm wrong? Or under which circumstances do I know that I'm wrong? That this trade isn't going to work. If we don't know where that point is, and we don't know where, uh, how much money we're going to lose if we get to that point, and then the, it's, we're doomed for failure. And this is unfortunately how many of us do it. We take the trade and think, oh, this is great. Take a position and then retrospectively think, okay, uh, where do I get out if I got this wrong? Instead of thinking about those things before we get into the trade, right? So that is the key to survival. We have to plan for failure before we start. So that's to be part of the process. So to give you an example, this is a distribution of uh, winning days and losing days uh, between two different traders. Okay, 
so this is profit and loss per day. This, this one doesn't show the numbers, uh, but profit and loss per day, and every day here it shows you the, the distribution of wins and losers. So look at the difference between these two graphs. This is someone who was relatively junior and learning. This is someone who's been doing it for like 15 years. What's the difference there? The losses are very few. Very, very few. So the notice received was these losses are too often, and these losses are absolutely no good. You've got to cut those out, and then you can get to that, right? This guy accumulates a ton of money. This guy makes a bit of money, gives it all back. Makes a bit of money, gives it all back. This was me, for the record. <laughs> that was the guy who was coaching me. Um, and this is also a month. This is some time ago. Okay, about a year and a half, two years old. But nonetheless, this, was, this is their code, right? So um, our goal is to cut out these bottom pieces and get to a graph or to a distribution where we see just small losers. I mean, there's not like there's no losers in there. There's a bunch of losers in there. But they're tiny compared to the, the majority, which sits in this like meaty part here. Every now and then, we all trade. We think that you're going to go for you know like 100 grand or 50 grand a day. Sure, that's a lot of fun. You can do that. But the the, the stuff that keeps you alive is the small wins consistently building into just a big sample size of small wins. Basically, that's what it is. So I just I read a good quote on Twitter the other day where the guy said. We all say that we want to trade for a living, but we all trade like we want to retire tomorrow. You know, we all think we're going to hit these big wins, but the truth is we've got to hit the little wins. We want to trade for a living; it's got to be a job. Can't be make on grand bucks, gone holiday for three months. You know, it's not how the game works. So anyway, so okay, so let's get to the two percent rule. Um, we all know how that works, right? So the 2% rule basically says you have to determine the stop loss and manage the position size to only lose 2% of capital when you are stopped out. This is something we're all familiar with, am I correct? Okay, so to break down some of the things, you have to predetermine, so you have to know where your stop loss is going to be. That's the first sort of thing, right? Then you have to manage your position size. You have to work, how big or, work out how big or small you have to trade in order to lose only 2% of your capital. You can also include your cost of trading, the broken cost, into that, right? So for most people that's 0.2%, so that adds 0.4% of the value um, of the transaction, right? You can include, because you've got to buy and sell, so 0 0.2, .2. so you can include that in your calculation for 2%, because if you don't, then you keep losing 2.4%, and you think you're losing 2%, but you're actually losing a bit more, so it throws off your thing. And so, if you, you can, it doesn't matter if you include or exclude it, but you have to at least know that there is a difference, especially when you come and track these things. And you think, well, I've had 10 losers in a row, why am I down 25% and not 2 not 20%? And that's because that broken fee is unaccounted for, right? Um, so, it's important to, to know. And then you have to lose only 2% when you get a problem, right? Or 2.5%, depending on how you, how you work it out. Um, and you, this means that you have to have a large sample size. You have to have, you can't do this over 10 trades and think that, well, it's not working. It's got to go over hundreds of trades before you, I mean, those things, there's 350 days almost worth of, of data there, you know, it's like almost two years of trading there. So you have to have a really big sample size before you can draw any kind of value from whether or not your system that you're using is working. So now we're not here to discuss the systems, we're more here to discuss just one element of the system, which is risk management, right? And then when you get stopped out, so being stopped out, what stops us here, this is where we get to think, because we're all very good at saying, well, this is the level, this is the risk, got to trade this many shares, da 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 da, and then you get there and you just kind of move the support level down a bit because, hey, it looks, you know, like I'm right. So that stubbornness to admit we're wrong is the, the main stumbling block. Um, the way to overcome that is you make a very clear set of rules um, and you almost get like obsessed by the process of following these rules and that is then what, what gives you discipline, right? So the little thing that freedom demands discipline. You know, there are people, I promise you, there are people who trade a few hours in the morning and then go hunting or go fishing or play golf or do whatever that are 
don't really need even living this life, but they are disciplined, and that is why they can. All right? So to calculate the two percent uh, risk on your portfolio, it's obviously two percent of your portfolio divided by the risk you're taking, because it's position size. Two, so let's say you've got two hundred fifty thousand in your account. Two percent of that is five grand. Um, the price of the stock you want to trade is hundred bucks. You want to go long. The stock loss is at ninety five. Therefore, your risk is five grand. So you say your two percent divided by the risk gives you a thousand shares. That you can That's how you calculate your position size. This, I think. We all know. So, what you can do or with that is incorporate average true range in order to make that a bit more uh, useful to us. Right? So, not necessarily useful in the sense that it's going to help us identify better levels, right? but useful in the sense that once the trade is in our favor, we can stay in that trade for longer without the risk of losing money. So, the idea here is that uh, once the ATR, uh, where do I start? So, okay, I'll start as I planned. So, average true range was developed by some guy in 1979 and 1978. Uh, so, it's a very long time ago that they came up with this. Uh, it is a piece of technical analysis or quantitative analysis, right? It is a, an oscillator at the bottom of the chart, like an indicator, that measures volatility. It doesn't measure the direction of the market, it just measures what the volatility in the market is um, at the moment. So what we can do is we can improve on the 2% rule by adding a trading stop loss feature to it. Um, and the, the, the trading stop loss method that we use tries to obviously maximize the profit that we can get from any trend or move, or whatever the case is coming from the market, right? So there's three different ways of, um, of calculating true range. So first, in order for you to get to average true range, you first need to calculate true range. So average true range is calculated over 14 periods, right? So we three weeks worth of trading, um, or 14 trading days worth of data to create the average true range. Before we can get there, we first need to work out what true range is on any given day, right? There's three different methods of how to do that. So if it's an outside day, in other words, if the trading range today is larger than yesterday's, in other words, the low is lower and the high is higher, then we measure the high low of the, of the uh, <coughs> trading day, and that gives us the true range for that day. Uh, the second method is for when there is, uh, like, well, method two and three is different ways that we can then use to measure true range under different circumstances. So to give you some examples, uh, so method one, as I said, if it's an outside day, if the current high or low is, if the candle is bigger than yesterday's, then uh, we measure just the high low of that candle. If it is a gap or an inside day, then there are three different ways of, of working it out, right? So in the first example, we have um, a very small range, but completely outside of the previous day's range. We then measure basically the current high of that candle or bar, minus the previous close. We can't get negative answers, so that's why we have different methodologies. So in this case, for example, the true range is the lowest low of today minus the previous close of yesterday. So normally we would measure just the high low of the day, but because that range is so small and outside of yesterday's, we take yesterday's closing price and we can measure the high of today and the converse of price. So this is under situations where the market's gap to move Right? So it's left a gap from yesterday to today and the range is small today. Or big or whatever the case is, but when there's a gap we measure that thing. And we always try and measure it in such a way that we can get a positive answer. So in this case it'll be the previous close minus the current low. In this case it'll be the current high minus the previous close. So you get a positive and absolute number, right? In the case of an inside day, uh, where what that means is the trading range for today is inside of yesterday's trading range, high and low is within yesterday's high and low, then we just measure basically to the high minus the, the previous close. And the other way around, if it's a, if it's a down day, right? So then that gives us, uh, and what we're doing basically, is of all three of these methods, all three of them that we are using to calculate this stuff, we use the biggest number of all three of them to determine what the true range is on that day. So on this table here you can see uh, we've got some prices, high, low, close for the day, um, and then we are measuring the high, low of each day, 
um, the uh, high versus the close of the previous day, the low versus the close of the previous day, and then we take the highest value as the true range for that day. All right? Um, then we apply the basic equation that says the current ATR, or average true range, is the prior ATR. So in this case, if we have to work out ATR, the first 13 spots, the first 13 spots is empty. Spot number 14, we can now work out the, 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 um, the average true range. So what we do is we take the previous ATR, we multiply it by 13, we add today's true range, and we divide it by 14 when we get to that. And then now we have a basis that we can say, okay, yesterday's uh, true range was that, um, times it by 13, add today's, divide by 14, gives us that. And you just keep doing that, and that then plots this lovely line <coughs> that we have here. Okay, so this gives us a nice indication of volatility. So when we see the trading ranges increase, like there, ATR rises. When we see trading ranges compress, ATR comes down. Okay? Questions, guys? No. Okay. Um, so now the ATR times two stop loss method. ATR times two stop loss method. Uh, we basically, in accordance to whatever strategies that you're using, um, you place a stop loss there. You work out your two percent, and you take your position size based on that. Right. Once the market has moved in your favor, so obviously you measure the what the ATR reading is at the time that you enter the trade. Once the market has moved in your favor as much as what that ATR is, so let's say ATR is 1 Rand, um, so ATR times 2 is then 2 Rand. So once your position is 2 Rand in the money, then you move your, so you start adjusting your stop loss in accordance with the trading methodology of the ATR. So what we're basically doing is we're measuring the high or the closing price of the highest bar <coughs> since we got into the trade. Minus ATR times 2 equals our stop loss. So then as the market moves in our favor, the stop loss will move up. But because ATR is a dynamic indicator, as volatility in the stock decreases, the, so you can see here, as volatility decreases and the price is moving nicely up, the ATR starts coming down. So that tightens the stop loss continuously. Right? During a period then of uh, sort of low volatility, it pulls up into, into a breakout either in your favor or against you, that ATR will compress and your stop loss will tighten. If then uh, the sort of market breaks out in a direction, ATR then increases. Instead of then, so you know, one sort of rule of thumb is to never then adjust your your ATR stop loss value low. So if the market's moved up uh, and your stop is at ten, and you know there's a breakout. At, runs to 12, ATR pulls open, you don't now move your stop loss from 10 to 9 because volatility is high. You just leave it at 10, let the market run a bit, and then once volatility starts to compress, your, your stop loss will trend higher again. So that kind of allows you to ride the trend as far as you can, uh, as far as you can using this. Um, have you guys got questions so far? Okay, cool. Then this is an example that I used once before. Um, of a short. So we've got a nice little Dow Theory uh, uptrend, high highs, high lows. Uh, we measure ATR at the time we've decided we want to go short. We just broke the low, we want to go short, so we measure ATR is 86 cents, times 2 is 172. So we then enter our trade here at uh, 10808, and we add 172 to our stop, and our level is there 1980. Right? The market comes down, and our ATR ratchets down 172. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm not dynamically adjusting that, I'm just dragging that 172 down, right? Until the market has reversed 172 against us and we then get out. In a situation where it doesn't quite take out the stop loss, we then just trade it all the way down. Um, that stop loss, as volatility decreases here in this flat part, that stop loss will then tighten up. And if we have a breakout up, we stop up. If we have a breakout down, we stand trade. And we just then you know, readjust our, our stop loss. In this particular situation, what would have happened here is the ATR at the time here was 86 cents. So our stop loss uh, is only 172 away. But at this time where this breakout takes place, the ATR is now 90 cents. So that stop loss would be wider. So you wouldn't then adjust your stop up because the ATR is now bigger. You would just kind of leave it the same. 
right? So to help with this, again, the spreadsheet, um, and this is where I think becoming obsessed with the process that is managing stop losses is what keeps us disciplined. Because if you've got to plug in every day, at the end of the day, what your closing price is so that you can manually calculate where your stop loss should be, when that stop loss comes, you're more likely to pull it than just having like, oh, when it gets there, there's a line. You know, or my stop has been at this level for so long now, you know, whatever the case is, it gets close, I can't, can't just cancel. Um, if you follow this process, then it helps a lot with the discipline that you need in order to, to execute the stops, right? So, to use a spreadsheet like this, basically what I'm doing here is I'm measuring the you know, number of days, uh, the ATR reading on that day, ATR times 2 reading on that day, the closing price, and then I'm subtracting ATR times 2 minus closing price to give you my stop loss, and that gives me how much risk I'm taking, um, and then, well, my ATR stop loss is calculated here. So, it's quite a clever spreadsheet, I'll make it available for you guys. Please um, drop a mail or ask Simon or someone, I can email you the spreadsheet. It's, it's pretty cool how, how it works out for you. Um, and basically, it just shows you like every time, do I adjust my stop? So my stop loss is here to take you through it. My entry here was 61 rand, uh, 61 rand 42, right? And the stop loss was 57 rand and some change. Uh, 57 rand 52. So what happens now is that when the market closes at 61.42, my stop loss, which is where my entry was, my stop loss is at 57. The next day the market goes up to 62, but ATR times 2 is still much bigger than what my initial stop loss was. So I don't move my stop loss. Eventually the market sort of trades uh, up in my favor until the price gets to um, 61.66. And then now ATR is, the ATR times 2 reading is smaller than what my initial stop loss was. So I adjust my stop loss up. Right? And then price will go sort of up and down through time. And every time that price pushes higher and increases the level of my ATR stop, I move it up. And only on those up moves do I make adjustments to my, to my stop loss. And that then allows you to, to kind of drag your stop um, and account for volatility at the same time. So, if volatility picks up, price might explode higher, but your stop loss might. But if volatility then compresses again, then your stop loss will very quickly move up. So you're basically allowing the market to go a little wild, only if in your favor. If not in your favor, taking out the trade. So it's a very nice way of, uh, of doing it. And building stuff like this really, really helps me, at least, to be disciplined enough to stick to the to the, to the rules. Um, questions, guys? Is it just to stop loss in the morning, in the auction period? Um, so you use the closing price, so you can do it in the morning, yeah. Okay. You can do it in the morning. What you can also do, it depends on how you trade, but um, and there's no way, that there's no platform that I found that's automated yet where you can say like, only stop me out if the closing price for the day is below this level. Yeah. A lot of the time you just get stopped. So if you have the time, what I'll do is I'll adjust my stops, sort of, I'll look at where the market price is on, and in the closing auction decide whether or not I'm going to close the yeah. position. Yeah. Um, because even later we'll get to an example where it goes through the stop, and then by the close it's not. And if you executed the stop intraday, you'd be, you'd be out of the trade. Yeah. You have yeah, I wanted to ask if you were not trading, not day trading, if you were to investing, could you use this method for stop losses mm -hmm. for longer term trades and maybe looking at instead of days? You look at weeks, yeah, sure, absolutely. So um, you use the same kind of Exactly the same method, just you use longer term data. Yeah. I think it works really well. That is so would it work for that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it works quite well in weekly, you need to drop monthly, but the weekly to ATR can give you a nice big chunky space. Yeah, I mean, then it measures the true range of the whole week. Mm -hmm. right. uh, yeah. Do you, do you use this to track all of your active trades? Can you also do your spreadsheet over there to like track your watch list trades and your watch list as well? So you wouldn't track your watch list with this, you just track open trades. Okay, so sure. I mean, you could, but that's like yeah. mission. <laughs> you know? um, but you could, you could, like, you could. So what we actually had is one of the guys, I don't know, who uses ProTrader? 
You want to use Poke Cutter? Cool. So one of the clients that we have made a little indicator, custom indicator for Poke Cutter. You can install it, and we'll show you that ETR times two line. You know, market. Yeah. Is, it, is it an extra? Superimposed on the on the app, on the price chart, yeah. The so then you like like it follows it, yeah. It's like a bottom yeah. and then every time it goes up, you just put your, you know, like a little line on it, horizontal line. And if it ticks down, then don't. But that horizontal line is your. And then if it ticks up, you drag your horizontal line up. Um, it's just a line, but it really works well because then it does all the math for you, right? <laughs> you don't have to have a spreadsheet, but. Um, but yeah, so there's still, but they'll like send it to you. It's, yeah. Like it's really easy to just import it from your phone. Yeah. No, no. um, so where do you place the stop loss? Right? This is probably the most uh, the crux of it. Um, there's three basic, well, three things that we'll look at. One is just using a trend. Okay. The second is using longer term price patterns, and then the third is, is a bit more exciting, it's like trading gaps and that kind of stuff, right? So, using a trend, we know doubt theory, this is something that I've spoken about before higher highs, higher lows, right? Um, once we have, once we see consecutive, the market making consecutive higher highs and higher lows, we have an uptrend. Within that, we have three different, um, three different types of trends. We have a primary, secondary, and tertiary trend. Right, so our first step is to identify where our, what is the primary trend, aka okay, if you look at a three-year price chart, which way is it going? <coughs> what is the secondary trend and what is the tertiary trend? The trade that we're about to take, we have to follow a trend, you know, we can be counter trend traders, some people are successful at that, some people are, but a lot fewer than people who are just, you know, follow the cork kind of thing. So we have to identify where are we in this trend. Then we have to identify, um, a point of support or resistance within that trend, and that is then our stop loss. Okay, um, so keep a few things on market theory. I mean, on dark theory, trends exist despite all the noise. Okay, so um, Trump is going to kill us all and all that stuff. <laughs> the trend is up, guys. <laughs> despite all that, the trend is up. Yes, we've had a pullback, but that is a tertiary well, the way I look at it, a tertiary trend pullback. Primary trend is up, right? Um, so markets temporarily move in the direction opposite to the trend, but soon return to the primary move. So the primary move is a three to five year price chart trend. That is the primary trend. So in the short term, we can move down in the opposite direction of whatever that trend is, but it will revert to that primary trend at some point. Um, and we have to give it the benefit of the doubt until we have a body of evidence that proves us wrong. Right? Um, most simply put, lower highs, lower lows, and you have a, a new trend. So any reversal, any sort of potential reversal, must be considered as a uh, within the context of it's going to divert back to its primary trend until we have enough evidence that we're not in that primary trend. So to identify supports, points of support, uh, points of support and resistance, uh, we can use different methodologies. One is called the Demarco Williams method. Um, to identify a point of support or resistance. <coughs> this is like the easiest <coughs> stuff in the world. I think it was, oh, it was also in the 70s at some point where these guys cooked up this you know, technical analysis stuff and they came up with this DeMarco Williams, well, two guys, DeMarc and Williams, came up with this thing. So basically what they do is they look at the a number of bar charts, I'll show you examples, um, in a second, and they just look at the two candles on either side of what we suspect is a point of support or resistance. You take a photo for that. <laughs> so, uh, this is basically a daily chart. So, you'll notice that I'm using bar charts instead of candles, right? Essentially, they're the same thing, um, just the candle is a bit easier to see, right? Um, so a bar chart works the same as a candle, you've got your opening price, you've got your closing price, and you've got your range in the middle. Okay? Yes. The candle would just have a nice little block in there that's colored in. Um, so this one here that I've marked over here uh, is very obviously the highest sort of bar in this, uh, in this range that we're trading at the moment, right? So what you're looking at to identify a, we'll call it a validated point of resistance, okay? Um, is we look at this candle that we suspect is our high bar, or high bars, it's a suspected high bar at this point, and we look at the, the candles on either side of them, and we see that this one 
has a lower high, and this one has a lower high. So this is the highest high between these three candles, so therefore that is then our point of resistance. Same on the way down, right? This candle here makes a low. The low there is higher, and the low on the other side is higher, so that is then our point of support. <coughs> So we can say that's our resistance, that's our support. The same goes for this candle. You can say the same for that candle. Uh, you can say the same for that candle, this point of resistance. This point of resistance. Uh, that would be support, right? So you can draw hundreds of them, you just need three candles to tell you if there's a point of support and resistance there, right? But what you're doing is if you're trading in a trend, let's say you trade a triangle breakout, whatever the case is, and you need to set your stop loss, to put your stop loss, you need to find it, you need to put it below a validated point of support. So if you're going long here, that will be your stop loss. Mm -hmm. right? um, in fact, if you're a trend follower, what's safer to do is to not use the most recent low, but two lows prior. So you use that level as a stop loss. So you don't have to just suck levels out the air because you think there's a trend line there. You can actually go and look at the chart and say, where is the valid point of support? What is the lowest point here that we can say is a is a support level? And then you put your stop loss just below that. So in a trend following context, this is kind of what it would look like. After every major pullback here that you can see, I've put I've identified the Demar Orleans low bar or point of support, and that would be a stop loss. So if you enter into, for example, a triangle uh, like a pennant breakout, bullish pennant breakout here, your stop loss would be somewhere around there. If you're a very strict trend follower and very conservative, you can put your stop loss two stops prior. So you're giving yourself all of that space to be wrong. Which is unfortunate because now if that is 2% risk, how much do you have to go to make 2% profit? Okay, so this makes you think, ah, this is a silly thing, stop us from to do and never going to make any money. Well, guess what? You've got to do 200 trades before you know if it's going to work or not. Remember, we're trading for a living. We're not trading to retire tomorrow. You make 10 grand if you get 20 cents in your favor, but then unfortunately, <coughs> trades got to go 2 grand, 4 grand before you know you're wrong. Statistically here, it's 50-50 which way it goes. So you've got to manage your risk. And these identifying validated points of support and resistance is a great place to identify where you put your stop. So it's a very simple three bar pattern. Right? Uh, then longer term patterns. So there's a whole bunch of them here. I'm sure you guys have seen all of these before. Um, symmetrical triangles in all directions. With triangles, mm -hmm. what you want to do is if this triangle breaks out, now we know what the rules are around long-term pattern breakouts, right? You need to have a breakout, often then the retest, and then a continuation. Also, that breakout needs to happen on higher than average volume. So you have to watch the volume that's trading on the you know on a daily basis. And the day that the breaks out, you want like to see at least one and a half to two times as much volume as what it usually trade to validate that breakout. In order then to set your stop loss. Um, depending on the pattern, you have different different rules. So a concept here is called a consolidation extreme. Okay, so the extremes of this consolidation are these blue lines. Right. So in this case of these flat top and flat bottom triangles, you can use the consolidation, the most recent low in the console of the consolidation extreme. Right. So just below that, but you would use that the Marco Williams method to point out where the low is, because the real body of the candle, you guys know what that is, right? The real body of the candle might be inside your support level, might be inside your trend line that forms your pattern, but the point of resistance is the low of that candle. Below that is where the stop loss is. That's like the extreme consolidation extreme on the other side, right? So that has to reach beyond that point before you know that it's in the opposite direction. In the case of uh, sort of broadening patterns or megaphones or whatever you want to call them, you find the widest part of the of the wedge of the consolidation and you put it halfway uh, in the middle of that. Okay, so you can 
obviously it's not going to be smooth right up and down. There's going to be lots of little ways in and out, especially with these megaphones that are usually out of a month. Uh, Coronation in like 2013, I think there's a beautiful one there, but it took two years to mold to make. You know? So in there you can find a, a somewhere around the middle of that, between the, the highs and lows of that consolidation, you can find a point of support and use that as your as your um, as your stop loss level, right? Uh, double tops and double bottoms is pretty much the same theory where you put your stop loss halfway between. And the reason you put your stop halfway between is just so that you can skew the risk reward in your favor, right? If a stop, a double top or double bottom, the target for that formation is in the case of a of double bottom here. The market comes down, forms a bottom, we'll make a validate point of support. Well, find some resistance, make another validate point of support. Note that these will not be absolutely the same. They are roughly the same. They will not be absolutely the same. Um, and if they are, it's like really super rare. <laughs> okay? Uh, but then the, to target this formation is basically the measure of the neckline to the base here. So where the two bottoms are to the <coughs> the point where it bounced between the two bottoms. That distance from the two bottoms to the extreme of the bounce, that is the target out. So to keep your risk reward one to two, you have to put your stop loss halfway in that sort of bottom level. Right? Um, with this, the risk reward can get much better with the, the trying of the stuff because you can basically say it's whatever your validated support or resistance is um, on the opposite the end of the extreme, but the most recent low or the most recent high. Okay? Um, and you can get a like a one to five or one to seven or something like that. Yes. When you use this system to identify your stop loss, how often is the stop loss anywhere near the two times ATR? So often not at all. So you have to wait for the trade then to go into your favor with two times ATR. So it'll be deep in the money by the time you stop trading. So what you want to do is with that two times ATR is you don't want to start ratcheting your stop higher until your stop loss can be a break even. Only then do you start ratcheting it up. So if your stop loss, say for example, uh, is one rand here, but ATR times two is two rand fifty. Yeah. This trade has to be two rand fifty in the money before you can start getting the trade and stop. That's the involved here. Does that make sense? So that you don't, um, because now what happens is if you use ATR times 2 straight out, your stop might be done here. Because you've still got the 14 <coughs> periods of data. So it's the ATR mostly to do with the trading stuff? Yeah, so stop. the idea is to, to sort of start with, you apply your 2% rule to where your stop should be. Yeah. And then you take note of what the ATR is at the time. But once the trade is in the money by ATR times 2, then you apply that. So you're manually adjusting your stop all the Yes. Okay. Manually every day. Well, not every day, but you have to check every day. Um, just so that you like you give you you don't have to then use <coughs> absolute targets and trends. Um, okay. you can then sometimes bring things for long time before uh, before you get out. And that's kind of the idea, right? Variety of winners. So this is a way to fall well, this is a way that I try to like not get out of trades just um, because I can tell you even I mean, I've been phone Simon a few times. Oh man, I've got another train. Blah, blah, blah. And it runs for hours and days afterwards, and then you um, get into a small portion of it, right? Thank you. Okay, cool. Then uh, there's a couple of different patterns as well. Head and shoulders, we all know how that works. A couple of things around head and shoulders, because everybody loves head and shoulders. If a head and shoulders formation, you can spot it, is in the middle of a trading range. Not head and shoulders. Okay? It has to be at the top of an uptrend or an inverse head and shoulders at the bottom of the downtrend. If it's not in one of those two places, it's not head and shoulders. It's just two ABCs stuck together, and that's maybe uh, a bit more pattern stuff that we'll get into at another time. But um, basically, it's the same sort of premise. We measure the, uh, it's obviously visually very easy to identify. And the right shoulder is where we put our stop, just above it. But not just above, um, you know, because we're going to draw this thing with real bodies or with a line chart or whatever the case is. We have to switch that to a bar chart to find our DeMarco Williams high bar or point of resistance and put the stop just above that. Right? So if the high bar comes to you know, 17 rand 22, 
you're going to want to stop out at 725. Um, so that it can, it has to first breach your level. You don't want it to trade there and then you stop and then it just trades one, two trades there. You don't want to guys throw to stop and then it goes in favor again. So it has to breach that level, but it's got to be the DeMarco Williams validated point of support resistance. Right. Um, so yeah, same on the way uh, on the opposite end. So you want to go to low. Uh, with the sort of pennant patterns. So it's ironic that flat bottom and flat tops, as well as pennants, are actually pretty much 50-50 whether they they bullish or bearish, right? So often we think flat top is a bullish triangle. It depends on who you ask. Uh, most people say it's a bullish continuation pattern, but it's also a bearish reversal pattern. Um, so it's actually called a bilateral pattern. It's the thing because it's like toss a coin. So you wait for the break, basically. It's same with pens, right? Uh, wedges are a bit more reliable, but uh, falling wedges, again, with, in the case of falling wedges, the lowest low in the consolidation extreme. Rising wedge is the highest high, which is kind of different to what a leading wedge. So your risk reward here is well, as good as it can get, basically. Yes. Just a question. So I found that the pennant, right? Um, so let's say you enter breaks up. You reach your target. Do you how much profit do you take before you just continue riding? All right. So, so okay. So to measure the target is you measure the widest part of the wedge, right? So same with the falling wedges uh, and the pennants and the triangles. Anything that sort of consolidates or compresses into a point where it breaks up, you measure the widest point of that wedge as your target, right? Um, but the idea here is to set a 2% rule stop on, okay, what is the entry here would be the stop for the short, and what is the entry for the short would be the stop for the long, right? Um, but the idea would be to calculate the 2% there, and then kind of just ignore the target. Let it run. Okay, so you wouldn't take any profit then, just in the whole position right then? Well, the thing bigger position is. I guess. But yeah. Also, you know, there's, whole, there's a notion of take half, Take a third, take uh, whatever. <clears throat> That's fine, but if you're using the 2% stop loss rule, um, taking half, I mean, the brokerage cost is probably going to negate the additional benefit, right? Because now you have to, now you have to broker three times on a trade, um, and you maybe make an extra 400 bucks, but your brokerage is now 600 rand on a trade instead of 400. So it's not necessarily always worth it, uh, unless you trade like big. You know, um, where one percent of the portfolio makes like a big difference, then you can, um, then you can do that. So I mean, even with like a two hundred fifty thousand rand account, taking five grand risk of trade, and you get them right, you get ten grand. You get them wrong, you lose five. So you lose half the time. You know, you're not really making that much money. Um, so taking half doesn't really uh, doesn't really benefit. I would rather than taking off half, I'd rather say wait till it's in the money, either it's in my target and I take all the cash, or wait till it's in the money eight or times two, put the trading stop on, and then I know I've got like a risk free position because if it hits me out then I'm at entry, um, so I've lost nothing, or it can go you know, who knows how far. Um, so it's a bit harder because you can't like say it's now it becomes more challenging to measure your risk reward. Right? Because you, you want one to two risk of all trades, but now you don't know how much reward you're going to get. All you're doing is you're measuring and containing risk at 2%. That's all you're doing. And you're just hoping that the things, uh, the things work in favor. It's just a bit of a paradox. Yes? So if you decided on the 2% rule, that depends on your portfolio mm -hmm. improvement But if something has gone in your favor and it's gone really high, now you're actually risking a bigger percentage of the buffer. Do you change that? Yes. So as long as that trade is open and there's an ATR times two on it, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna not gonna downscale. So you don't rebalance it. Once the trade is closed, yeah. let's say that you've made fifty percent in your portfolio, yeah. then you have to readjust your yeah, no, your two percent. Like but while it's open, okay. don't mess with it. Because what? Because then what's, you, what's going to happen is you're going to die. You're going to sell some, sell some, sell yeah. some to rebalance the whole thing, yeah. and then you've sold your biggest winner. Um, and you know, like this is, I think this is something that's really tough because, like, if you look at something like Nasdaq, you know, fund managers bought it, you know, it was 100 grand a share, 
It's now 3,000 an inch in. In the one way out there, they had to sew, had to sew, had to sew all the way. If they did, <laughs> you know, how much better would those funds be? So um, it's a bit hard. I'd say don't, don't mess with something until it's closed. Um, so yes, the HR times two might not come down, it might cost you 10% of your portfolio. But you know what, if the profit on that trade is so big that whatever the HR times two is cost you 10%, you're probably up over 50% in your portfolio on that one trade. Right, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. I think what happens is we count the money before we've closed the trades. You think, yeah, see, this thing is going so well, lack and lack and lack and look at my portfolio. No, the trade is open. Mm -hmm. That's the difference, I guess, between long term investing and um, trading, mm -hmm. as where you know, as a long term investor, you don't really want to sell it because you don't want to pay tax and all sorts of stuff on it. But as a short term trader, you have to sell it because it's not real until it's closed. So it's a bit of a fireball in your head, I guess. So then, okay, then there's a couple of things we're going to talk about gaps, which is um, <clears throat> something that also I recently kind of looked into because uh, people like gaps and, and whatever. <clears throat> so, one of the, first, the rule that all gaps must be closed is a lie. All gaps must not be closed. Um, we've got seven minutes. Quick. Okay, so there's two different ways that I want to look at. I want to look at runaway gaps um, or breakaway gaps, as they call and I want to look at uh, opening gaps. Okay? Sorry, what is that last one? Uh, opening gap. Opening gap. Okay, so a breakaway gap or a runaway gap, uh, there's a method uh, sorry, called uh, an explosion gap pivot that you can use to trade in. Right? So basically, uh, we're going to go back to this to Marco Williams' point of support resistance. In this gap scenario, those validated points of support or resistance is called the pivot. Okay, so some of you guys might use pivot points as well. I know all the traders love pivot points. Um, it's not the same as that pivot point. Um, it's the same as a validated point of support resistance by the Marco Williams 3 bar thing. Okay? Um, so exposure gap and pivot looks basically for there's a gap. The market sort of forms a bit of a range. It pulls back into the gap uh, area, and then from there explodes higher. That low in between the gap area that is called the pivot. The pivot low. That's your stop loss. Okay. Um, so the low bar is the pivot. Um, to prevent false signals, a breakaway gap must form a 20-day high or a 20-period high. So if you're using a 10-minute chart or a two-hour chart, whatever it is that you're using. For the last 20 bars or candles, if there's a gap and it breaks away to, to be classed as a breakaway gap or run a gap, it has to make a new high or a new low. If it doesn't, then you ignore it and it doesn't come. Yes? Do these, does this gap theory work on any time frame? Yeah. So you'll find that, um, like, indices don't really gap, like the Aussie future might. But the Aussie spot market doesn't really, unless it's like gaps over weekends and stuff. And also, it's a market average, so it's not really a tradable instrument. Um, weekly gaps are rare, to be truthful. What sometimes happens is gaps and spikes are very much the same thing. Because all that it is is a space, a price area where no shares, <coughs> no shares traded in hands, exchange hands between 10 Rand and 12 Rand. So that's a gap. If that happens intraday, uh, on a five minute chart or a one minute chart, you might see a gap. But on a one hour chart, you're just going to see a hell of a spike. Yeah. Right? So that spike on a shorter term time frame is a gap. If that makes sense. Yeah. And does it work on currencies? Currencies tend not to gap so much, uh, just because they're 24 hour markets. So the only time they really gap is when markets open, or if it's like really liquid in that time where, um, where markets, like one week's closing and the other one's opening. Those are called, uh, I can't remember they've got a specific name, but they have meanings. Okay. So you ignore those. So currency gaps don't even, okay. don't even bother. Uh, the only stuff that's really helpful to trade with gaps is stock, right? Equities. Because there's an opening call period and there's a closing auction. And those two auctions determine the opening and closing price, and that's what the gaps are for. And they represent all the information that took place while the market was closed, right? Um, in markets where it's 24 hours, gaps mean nothing, So yeah, so basically what we do is we have to, uh, I'll just skip through all this and give you this, right? 
So this is basically a stock that we have daily bars on. And then this little gap here takes the candle. This is our, our 20 day high, and this breaches that 20 day high. So we have a potential for a breakaway gap. Okay? So now we've got to wait a few days in order for this explosion gap pivot set up to play out to see if it's going to come. Right? So what we basically do is we wait for a uh, pullback. So we measure the close here and the, the low of this here. So it's the high of the previous day and the low of the current day, and there's a huge gap between them. Okay? Um, we now need a pullback beneath this low, or beneath this, or underneath this gap level, but not all the way to the, uh, the gap extreme. Okay? So you don't want to close the gap, but you want to now form a Marco Williams validated point of support. Right? If you see that, that's your pivot low. The next candle, which is you know one of the mark candles, um, if that high is breached, you take the long. So there's two ways that you could have played this up. One, you would have taken a long on the entry of this uh, when this candle or when this bar breached the high. Right? But if you were taking entries without waiting for confirmation, then you would have stopped out there as well because it would have breached your low. Right? Because you if you entered as a breach the level, you have to stop as a breach the level. If you wait for the market to close, then you would only enter on that candle, or when that in that closing auction over there, because now you can see the market's going to close above um, above your, your level, and then that would become your pivot point. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, and then just for interest sake, back. Cool, that's fun. Yeah, it works. <laughs> it's rare, but it works. Um, so then your 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 stop loss is one of two things, and you can you will have to probably test and play and see what works best for you because all of our personalities are different, right? But the stop loss is this pivot low or the gap extreme. <coughs> okay. So any questions around this? Come on. When you say it's rare, how often do you see it playing out? Um, of that presenting, not well, okay, in your favor. Cecil, yesterday, mm -hmm. that was a, uh, that's just a breakaway gap, actually. Mm -hmm. That's smart today. And that's smart today. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Aspen the other day. Um, I see it regularly. Yeah, well, I mean, in a, in a city full of landmines, something's going to blow up, right? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, every now and then you see something like this, but generally, so there's really cool short-term uh, three, four-bar trend patterns that have like a ninety percent hit rate, but they occur twice a year. And what time frame is this? This is daily. Oh. Um, so this is a this is a short-term pattern. It consists basically it's a three-bar pattern, really, or a five-bar pattern. So I'm mean, using bars instead of candles, and you're just using the Basically, the the high, you know, the, the ranges of the. But don't you get the same information from the candles? You do, yeah, you do. I just prefer these. <laughs> you know why? Because this is what a um, our candles come kind of around a bit later than the bar stuff, um, and candles also there are hollow candles and there are full candles and stuff, and the most charting packages don't show the hollow candles, right? So and they mean different things. So if the candle is green but hollow then it's an update, but it still plays lower than yesterday's close. But it is an update. So with a normal candle thing, that would just show a solid green candle. But it's not actually showing you what it's supposed to be showing you. With this, you can see, like, the close is a bit more clear. So it's, um, but it's pretty much the same thing. In any case, so uh, then there's an opening gap. So an opening gap is basically, we sometimes think the market opens and there's a, uh, 200 point gap between where the oil closed yesterday and where it is now, so that's an open gap, right? Okay, most times that is a completely to be ignored gap, doesn't matter. Um, to start to class an open gap, it must take out the entire trading range of yesterday. So whatever the high was yesterday, the market needs to open higher than that. So you have to think of a daily candle all the time. So if the high of the yesterday's trading range is lower than today's open, then you have an opening gap. Or if the low of yesterday's trading range is higher than today's open, you have an opening gap. So an opening gap has the ability to 
over a longer time frame become a breakaway gap, then we can trade it this way. But in the short term, we want to find a way to trade it intraday, right? So there's a different way of, uh, uh, of trading. So a couple of notes first. Um, prices tend to sort of continue in the direction uh, that they put the, the gap forms, right? And if in this case it does, then that opening gap becomes the breakaway gap and we play it according to the daily moves on the, on the previous slides, right? Um, downward gaps, if the market gaps down, they tend not to close. Sometimes they do, but often they don't. So that's all case in point, right? Um, if the gap fall does not occur, then it's a breakaway gap. If the gap fall does occur, then well, it did. Uh, if the gap is not full, usually within the first 30 minutes of the trading day, odds are it's not going to fall. So sometimes you have that gap, and then immediately the market closes it. <clears throat> if it doesn't happen in the first 30 minutes, chances are it's going to continue to trend in the direction that it's gapped, right? Um, so to identify the setups, you use five minute candles or bars, and you basically use three, you do a three bar range, so you measure the trading range of the first three bars of the day, and then from there you set, um, you know, barriers to say if it reaches the low of that range, go short for gap close, if it reaches the high of that range, go long for continuation of the, range of the, of the gap, right? Uh, the range has got to be obvious. If it's not obvious, then do it. Because what happens sometimes is it opens and it runs and it runs and it runs, and I've got three candles and each one of them are, and there's no range there, it's just running. So you can't, then there's no play for you, right? So, example um, this is yesterday's trading range. Market forms an opening gap, from, it takes up the high. This is not yesterday's trading range, it's a couple of weeks on the chart. Um, but the market sort of takes out yesterday's high and opens there. So this is your opening gap, not yesterday's close, right? Yesterday's high and is the is the gap extreme, here, right? Um, you form a three bar range. If you break out the top of this three bar range, your stop loss is below the top of the gap because if it reaches this, chances are it's going to go close again. So it might even break out the high here. Put in a to mark point of uh, Mark or Williams, credit where it's uh, point of resistance, and then go and put, breach this level of open gap. So your stop loss is here, below this um, below this level. If this level is breached, your stop loss is there at the top of the three bar range, and your target is then there. So you can see the risk reward on this trade is skewed. To take this short, your risk is all the way up here, and your target is here. I mean, it's like half to one risk versus reward, right? You're risking one to make a sense. It's not, um, it's maybe not a trade that you want to take, but in the case where it breaks in your direction, your stop loss would be at the bottom here. Cool. I see people looking confused. <laughs> Any questions, guys? We're basically at the end. If you have to have quite a big account to cross the cross two percent, point two percent in and out, you've always got that minimum. Uh, so it depends on who you trade with. No. Um, so through uh, through my firm, uh, minimum is fifty bucks. Yeah, yeah. most of them are hundred bucks. Yeah, big red, huh? Yeah, they're killing people. But anyway, I can't say. Yeah. So no, fifty rand minimum is one. Uh, if you have, um, also depends on trade frequency. Like we do an account where there is basically no minimum, it costs minimum. So your minimum is 13 rand, 15 rand, whatever it costs. Minimum. Depending on, but that's your uh, your brokerage rate is then six basis points if you buy and sell the same day, 12 if you hold overnight versus mm -hmm. 20 with no minimum. But your monthly account is your account. So. It only makes sense if you're really actively trading to have that account. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then the normal account is sort of like 50 rand, which is. Like, it makes a difference, eh? 50 rand makes a big difference. But, um, yeah, I don't know. So, that, that minimum is a, is a thing. So, this is why I say it's important when you do these 2% calculations, include those costs in the population. Because you think, oh, 2%, it's maybe 500 bucks or 1,000 rand or whatever the case is. But um, when you then 
you know, head art and it's actually turned around or falling around at the time, then it, you know, it makes a huge difference in your current performance. So you have to try and include that. So it needs to track even smaller. Yeah. Yeah. There's no shame in tracking small. People are always like, oh, you know, you've got to <coughs> Big swinging whales, and it's not, those guys don't last that. Wow. Uh, and just confirming where we do entry point B. Um, so, in this, you measure your, your three bar range, right? So, one, two, three. And then, once you have a close above your three bar range, you have your entry. And your stop is then at the extreme of the range. Because if you breach the stream of the range to the downside, your target becomes the gap close. Um, in this situation, it's perfect to then say this is your stop loss, but your ATR might be here somewhere. So then, once the trade is in the money, once ATR drags you up to here, then you put the ATR. So then your um, then you might feel the position size is too small because your ATR is tighter than your because your ATR is going to take a while to adjust to the huge explosion of volatility that just happened, right? So your ATR in this scenario will definitely be tighter than your consolidation or your range extreme. So your ATR is going to be here. So you're going to feel that you're trading to small thing. But it's going to run, in theory, very strong. Is that uh, magnified at this point? Or is that... No, this is, the, actually, this is the chart. Yeah. This is clicks that put out so the results. So there's no um, range. And then something as well. It's just... So look... Um, I don't know, do you have viewpoint on it? <coughs> I want to kind of show you the chart. We have time, I don't know if you guys are in a rush. I'm always talking much more about it, but I'm already so. Um, and here's the clicks chart. Uh, let me take it. You want daily? Uh, that was five minutes, but give us daily and we can find it in And, oh, no, wrong button. You want both. Cool. So that was this. On the day. So that's the whole previous day. And this is that exposure. So this is, um, that's just five minute chart. Yeah, cool. That was basically. And okay, so you can see when the end ran really, really high, and you were probably would have stopped out here somewhere if you uh, if you got into the if you, yeah if you did the ATR loss stop because that peak well you wouldn't have been taken out on that peak that close would have been high but that's quite a big that's a big candle you know? so that's quite a big move so in that move down there probably would have taken out because on your uh, even on your five minute chart the average true range here is like. Two grand, you know, and then it explodes like 20 bucks up. Yeah. Um, so you would have been lucky, that would have been a good, end. probably the best design for that. Um, that's perfect, that's uh, perfect. Are they the same as like swing eyes and swing nose? Um, what do you mean swing high, swing low? Like, because they also do the uh, like it's low and you have a lot Oh, of right, right, right. So those, yes. So the, the Mark or Williams method. Or pivot highs, lows, or whatever. It's, it's the same as a string high low. So it's basically, um, so basically, in order to identify support and resistance levels, you would look at, um, you would say that is a demand high, 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 and you sort of just stick all of them, and you'll see it'll start forming like a thick line. Yeah. And that's your support resistance zone, right? Um, but for the purposes of um, very short of trading, just saying like, what is the extreme high of this range? It's that one there. So that's going to be our um, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Cool.